getting fancy now. I'm starting to figure this thing out. Uh, I've been playing around with it, and I think I've got some effects now, and videos, and pictures, and all kinds of cool stuff. A little bit of music, kind of get you in, in, in the right frame of mind for this. Um, uh, again, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Mike Biamonte, uh, manager of the School of Operational Medicine. Um, we left off last class, or last video, uh, with kind of part one of Anatomy and Physiology. I hope you enjoyed it. This is going to be a transition into the second half. Now, again, we're just hitting the tip of the icebergs here. We're just really going over some very general information, nothing earth shattering. Um, we're taking a, uh, a topic that people spend a lifetime studying and cramming it into two one hour video sessions. So, <laughs> um, but we're also going to repeat anatomy and physiology before every new topic. So when we start talking about airway issues and airway management, We'll do another review of, uh, of anatomy and physiology. Uh, again, I'm going to go through my book and just page by page. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to get a little bit more high tech now. I'm not going to be holding a, a, a an image in front of the camera. I think I figured out a way to embed images and, and have my voice in the background. So if it looks like I'm figuring this out as I go, I I actually am. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, again, disclaimer, nothing classified uh, in this presentation, uh, no endorsements in this presentation, and that's my spiel for that. So let's get started. Anatomy and physiology, we left off uh, the cardiovascular system, essentially, uh, and where I want to start with the cardiovascular system is looking at uh, blood uh, as, a, as a whole, if you will. Um, four components of blood, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a, a picture up on the screen so you can see. And what we're looking at here in the screen, or in this picture, is just a quick uh, diagram of the breakdown of blood. Um, again, we're not going to get crazy. Think of blood as four components. Uh, you got red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and plasma. Keep it simple. Although this picture goes into much more detail, we're not going to get into that kind of detail. So when we look at platelets, um, red blood cells, white blood cells, Plasma. Plasma is also broken down into three different components. It says four here, but we'll just talk about three. We'll talk about albumin, globulins, and fibrogen. So get a, a mental picture of uh, this image, and uh, we'll, we'll pull that off the screen and continue to talk about it. So red blood cells. We know what a red blood cell does. Uh, it carries oxygen, waste product to and from. It's a transport mechanism uh, for the whole body. Uh, white blood cells. Pretty straightforward, um, helps to fight infection, easy enough. Uh, platelets are the, uh, the, the sticky piece, the plugs, if you will, and we'll talk about that here in a minute as far as what it does and, and how in the cardiovascular emergency setting, uh, how we can have an effect on that. And then plasma, the watery part of blood. So the watery part of blood being plasma, albumins, globulins, and fibrogen. Think of it this way. Um, Albumin. Albumin is that, that it's stickiness. It gives blood its viscosity, its, its texture, if you will. So if you've ever picked a scab as a kid or as an adult, and you get that clear kind of, you know, yellowish fluid out, and you can feel that stickiness in between your fingers, that's the albumin, giving it its viscosity. Um, globulins help fight infection. Uh, for those of you who were ever military, or maybe not even military, but went overseas and got a gamma globulin shot in your, uh, in your glute, or on both sides. It's a thick, nasty, painful uh, injection, but it's a super, super booster for your immune system. And fibrogen is that mesh-like network. And the best way I like to describe it is try to imagine taking a piece of chain link fence and putting it over the top of a, of a sewer grate, and then take some newspapers and leaves and candy wrappers, whatever, and throw them on top of that piece of chain link fence, and now let it rain. Uh, what you've essentially just created is a clot. <clears throat> Pardon me. So when our body clots, what we're essentially doing is it's the body sending these defense mechanisms to that area, that area being where the bleeding is taking place, where that turbulent blood flow is taking place. Now the body doesn't differentiate between an external laceration on say a fingertip or turbulent blood flow within an artery or a coronary artery within your heart specifically. When we get into acute coronary syndromes and cardiology at another time, we'll talk in more detail about that. But if we have turbulent blood flow, the body picks up on that. It senses that. And what it does is it sends red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, plasma, everything to that area as a defense mechanism. And that's why that area tends to swell a little bit, like say when you cut your finger. 
So what's happening is the white blood cells are helping to fight infection. Uh, the platelets are being sent there to stick to fibrogen because now what happens is fibrogen creates this mesh-like network over a laceration or turbulent blood flow. And now the platelets come along and stick to it. We, in the pre-hospital setting, in the setting of acute coronary syndrome or somebody having a heart attack or chest pain, discomfort, we give them aspirin right away. Right? 81 milligrams, depending on what your protocol is, uh, 160 milligrams, 162 milligrams, uh, whatever your protocol. Give them baby aspirin, they chew it up, they swallow it. What that aspirin does is it puts a coating around platelets. So now they won't stick to each other, and more specifically, they won't stick to fibrogen, and you are preventing a clot from getting any larger. So we're not breaking up the clot, we're just preventing it from getting any larger. That's it. So in a nutshell, that's the components of blood. Um, let's see, let's see, we talked about that. All right, let's move on to the heart itself and the anatomy of the heart. Um, I like to think of the heart as a top and a bottom, a left and a right. All right, you have uh, the atria, which is the top of your heart, and you have the ventricles, which are the bottom of your heart. And contrary to popular belief, the heart doesn't beat all at the same time. Uh, that would be a cardiac standstill. That would be bad. We don't want that to happen. What ends up happening is the heart beats top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom. And I'll show you a video here in a minute as to, just to kind of describe that. So when we talk about lub dub lub dub and those noises, those are valves opening and closing. But this is how the heart beats. Boom, 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 boom. That's the normal cycle, if you will. So that's a top and bottom aspect of, of, of a heart. Your left and right side of your heart, high pressure versus low uh, pressure. So the right side of your heart is more of a low pressure side, uh, whereas the left side of your heart is more of a high pressure side. So I'm gonna put a video, or not a video, a picture up on the screen now so you can take a look. And if you look at this picture, you'll see RA, RV, uh, LA, LV, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, AO is aorta, and PA is pulmonary artery. So if we follow blood flow through the heart, and we start at the right atrium, just as an example, we have deoxygenated blood coming in from superior, inferior vena cava into the right atrium, down through that valve. And uh, when we look at different valves, when we look at uh, um, atrioventricular valves or AV valves, I always like to think of rat and lamb, R-A-T and L-A-M-B. Uh, rat being right atrium tricuspid, and lamb being left atrium mitral or bicuspid. And that's how I remember uh, the, the two different valves. So in this case, it goes through the tricuspid valve into the uh, right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it goes out through the pulmonic valve and into the pulmonary artery. The only artery in the body uh, outside of neonatology and, and that sort of uh, setting, um, or more specifically, uh, before you're born. Um, this is the only artery that carries deoxygenated blood. And it only goes uh, a short distance. It only goes to the lungs. When it goes to the lungs, it gets oxygenated and comes back. So hence the reason the right ventricle, the musculature of the right ventricle is really, really flimsy. There's not much to it. It doesn't need to be very strong because it's only being pushed out to the lungs. It's oxygenated, comes back via uh, pulmonary veins. Now these pulmonary veins are the only veins in the body that carry oxygenated blood. They go into the left atrium, down through the mitral or bicuspid, into the left ventricle. And left ventricle, and it doesn't show this very well in this picture, but the left ventricle is much, much more muscular uh, than the right ventricle because that's the high pressure side and has to push blood to the entire body. So when these ventricles contract at this, at this time, uh, now this blood goes out through your aortic valve, into your aorta, and around and through to the rest of your body. So now I'll pull that video or that picture off the screen. The aorta itself is a monster. It's a big, big blood vessel. I mean, it's as big around as your thumb. It's, it's, it's formidable, um, which is why if we have uh, a shearing injury, as it's called, where the, uh, the aorta gets kind of ripped in half because of deceleration trauma, or if we have an aneurysm where that aorta ruptures, it's pretty much lights out. Uh, that person's, uh, I don't want to say dog food, but they're, they're pretty well done. So this picture here I'm going to show you. Uh, it's just the outside of the heart, and it really gives you a better indication of the size of the pulmonary trunk and the, uh, the aorta. One structure I want to make of note there, if you look at the upper right-hand corner, um, the ligamentum arteriosum. The ligamentum arteriosum used to be a structure while we were in utero inside mama called your ductus arteriosus. This was the bypass. 
because uh, contrary to what the abyss that movie uh, tells us, you know, oh, your body breathed fluid for nine months. It'll remember. All right, poor shit. We didn't breathe fluid when we were inside mama. What ends up happening in fetal circulation is blood does come into the right side of the heart, and it is pushed out of the right ventricle. But if you look at where that ligamentum arteriosum is, that used to be a blood vessel, again called your ductus arteriosus. And there was also a hole, uh, your foramen oval, uh, between your uh, right and left atria. So in fetal circulation, blood never really made it to the left side of the heart. It would go through the atria all the way to the... Uh, it did go to the left side. Let me rephrase that. It just never makes it to the lungs. So in fetal circulation, blood comes into the right atrium, passes through directly to the left atrium, down to the left ventricle, and out through the aorta. Whatever blood does make it down to the right ventricle, as it gets pushed out through the pulmonary trunk, goes into this ductus arteriosus and right into the aorta. So you're bypassing the lungs altogether. We don't start to really use our lungs uh, until we take our first breath. And then that ligamentum or arteriosum or that ductus arteriosus starts to uh, solidify, if you will, or become rigid and firm and becomes more now an anchor and a connective piece of tissue than it is a blood vessel. And what happens in deceleration trauma, we have huge deceleration trauma, and I'll pull the, uh, the, the picture now off the screen. Um, during this deceleration trauma, you have your aorta and your pulmonary trunk, and this ligamentum arteriosum is the anchor point between the two. This deceleration trauma, what can happen is the heart can actually pull forward and shear and rip that aorta in half. And again, lights out. That person's dead before they knew what hit them. And that's a, a non-survivable type of wound. We, pre-hospitally, we wouldn't know that this happened other than to look at our patient and say, wow, they're pretty dead because of this significant deceleration trauma. It's only an autopsy <clears throat> would we really know about something like that, but that's just something that, that could happen. Um, so let's look now at the conduction system of the heart. So we've gone through the chambers of the heart. We've gone through the flow of blood through the heart, and we'll work our way through the entire cardiovascular system here in just a minute. But um, the heart itself is, is, is just so fantastically complicated. Um, all the cells of the heart, myocardial cells, have a property known as automaticity. They're able to generate their own electrical activity, which is really pretty cool. Last video, we talked about that neuromuscular junction, right, where a nerve ending had to plug into a muscle, and this nerve had to tell the muscle what to do. In the heart, it's a little different. The heart doesn't necessarily need that outside electrical stimulus to generate its own electrical activity. It goes through these five phases of, of depolarization, which I am not going to bore you with right now. That's a, a paramedic level and beyond thing. Um, but what it is, it's all about how electrolytes, uh, sodium, uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium, uh, the two big players or three big players really are uh, sodium, calcium, and potassium. It's how these electrolytes cross over this cellular membrane at the myocardial level to generate an electrical stimulus and the heart actually creates its own electricity. It's really pretty cool. But again, if you look at this picture here, you're looking at the electrical conduction system. Your SA node high in your right atrium, that's the pacemaker of the heart. Uh, intrinsic rate is about 60 to 100 times a minute. So every 60 or every, strike that, 60 to 100 times a minute, this SA node generates an impulse that overtakes the entire heart and overrides the entire heart and stimulates a contraction. So the SA node fires about 60 to 100 times a minute, goes through these internodal pathways, those, or these little wires, down to the AV node, atrioventricular node. From there, there's a slight delay, and it goes to what's called the bundle of hiss, and uh, the, the AV junction itself is considered the junctional space. Right? So you have your AV junction and your bundle of hiss, or your AV node and your bundle of hiss make up the AV junction. So in the advanced world, we talk about junctional rhythms, and those are rhythms that are initiated in this area. And the intrinsic rate of the AV junction is about 40 to 60 times a minute. So what that means is if the SA node fails and cannot stimulate that impulse, it'll default down to the AV node, where the AV node will kick in. But it's only going to be, give or take, about 40 to 60 times a minute. And there's a lot of variables to this. 
Um, so as we make our way down, uh, we go into the left and right bundle branches, which goes through your intraventricular septum, and it flares off into our uh, Purkinje fibers. And if, worst case scenario, the SA node fails and the AV node fails, well, now the Purkinje fibers kick in and creates a rhythm or a rate of only about 20 to 40 beats a minute, which is not good. Uh, this is a kind of a uh, making your way to the light kind of rhythm. All right, so I'll pull this picture off the screen. All right, wheel back, good. And let's continue on. So the electrical conduction system is what gives us our continuous heart rate from well before we're born, uh, ironically enough, till the day we die. Uh, it, it's just kicking away. It really is a, a marvel of engineering and, and whatever else you want to call it. Um, so this picture here is just going to give you a quick diagram of what blood flow. It's a cartoon, is all it is. It just gives you an idea of the atria contracting, the ventricles contracting, and blood being pushed out. And that lub dub uh, somewhere in the middle there. We're not here to listen to heart tones, uh, S1, S2, S3, S4, gallops, rubs, murmurs, all that. That's not what we're here to teach you. And quite frankly, as a paramedic, I could count on one hand the amount of times I've ever actually listened to heart tones in the field. It just, we don't do it very often. All right, so I'll pull that picture off. And we're going to go on now and look at the different layers of myocardium. So let's just take a step back for a second. Look at blood. We looked at the, the heart itself, the four different chambers. We looked at blood flow through the heart. Um, uh, we looked at the electrical conduction system of the heart. And now we're going to look at the different layers of the heart itself. All right, You have your outermost layer, and I'll put a picture up here now. Your outermost layer is your epicardium. Your middle layer, your thickest layer, your myocardium. And then you have your inner lining uh, inside the actual chambers themselves called the endocardium. Where we end up looking um, most critically during any kind of a cardiac event is at the myocardium. Uh, there are ways to tell if somebody is having what's considered to be an endocardial wall uh, infarction or, or a lack of blood flow to that area. Um, but we're more concerned with myocardial infarctions, MIs. So when we talk about an MI, we're talking about a lack of blood flow to that area of the heart. And if you notice on that picture, you'll see the, uh, the blue blood vessel and the red blood vessel. That's your coronary artery and your coronary vein. Notice how they run on the epicardial surface of the heart. They'll run along that surface, and at a certain point, they'll kind of right angle and dive down and feed the, ep the endocardium all the way through the, uh, the myocardium to the epicardium. But the fact that they're on the surface like that, and I'll put another picture up here right now to show you, the fact that they're on the surface like that, if you look at this picture, um, they're kind of covered by this cellophane wrap, or the pericardium, if you will. Now, in periods of extreme tachycardia, somebody is in a condition known as what's known as SVT, let's say, supraventricular tachycardia. Somebody's heartbeat is greater than 160 times a minute. Well, what will end up happening is now the heart is squeezing so fast at 160 times a minute those coronary arteries are being squished every time the heart contracts. Therefore, they never really have a time or a chance to fill. And if you look at this diagram and you look at the uh, left coronary artery and the right coronary artery, so basically if you find your aorta, um, which is sort of that second opening back from the bottom, um, notice the two first blood vessels that come off, the red ones, left and right coronary arteries. They're at a downward angle on purpose, that's by design. Reason being is when the heart relaxes and we go into what's known as a diastolic phase and the ventricles relax and fill, this is when those coronary arteries fill. They fill passively. They don't fill under direct pressure during ventricular systole. So ventricular systole is when the ventricles contract and squeeze blood into the aorta. That's when the majority of your arteries all throughout your body that's when they fill under pressure. Your coronary arteries are different, though. When the, ventr when the ventricles relax and go into ventricular diastole or relaxation, the flaps of the aorta close, and those arteries fill. So let me pull the picture now off of the screen. So now if your heart is beating normally, like this, you know, give or take 60 to 100 times a minute, there's plenty of time during that diastolic phase for those coronary arteries to fill, 
all the way through and down and to perfuse that myocardial tissue. If your heart is beating like this, right, there really is no time for those coronary arteries to fill. Therefore, we have this lack of blood flow to the myocardium. We now get uh, ischemic tissue, injured tissue, necrotic muscle tissue, MIs, and we have somebody going into anaerobic metabolism and chest pain and so on and so on and so on. So uh, in a lot of cases, from the paramedic perspective, I always try to teach what, why, and what. Right? What's going on with my patient? Why is it happening? And what can I do about it? So in the case of chest pain, a lot of newer paramedics, they'll knee-jerk and go right for the aspirin and the nitroglycerin and all the things that they were taught to do, whereas you have to look at the underlying cause. So somebody who's having chest pain because their heart rate is 200, well, what's going on? They're having chest pain. Why are they having chest pain? Well, because the heart's not getting enough or the myocardial tissue is not getting enough blood because the heart rate's too damn fast. So what can I do about it? You know, we have to slow the heart down. And we can either give a drug such as adenosine or amiodarone, um, or we can do a little Edison medicine and we can synchronize cardiovert this patient with electricity and get their heart rate to slow down. Once their heart rate slows down and it's back to a normal rate again, you'll see a night and day difference in your patient. You really will. It's pretty uh, profound when you do see it. All right, so... Let's move on and through. We talked about that. We talked about that. All right, let's start talking about some of the blood vessels in general, the cardiovascular system. Keep it simple. Um, arteries versus veins. A lot of people would say, oh, arteries carry oxygenated blood. Well, now we know it's not the case based on what we just saw a few minutes ago. Think of arteries as always carrying, a blood, carrying blood away, A for away, right? Stupid way of remembering things, but that's how I remember them. But arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Veins always bring blood back to the heart. Pretty easy. Um, arteries are also very, very muscular. Many different layers, well, seven different layers within, a, within an artery uh, versus a vein. A vein is a bit more floppy, a bit more flimsy, but veins have valves in them to prevent backflow, just one-way valves. So if you think about blood going from your feet to your heart while you're standing up, every time your heart beats, blood goes up a little bit more. What's to prevent it from going all the way back down to your feet are these one-way valves. And they'll open and close, open and close, and blood will kind of move its way up in, in sections. When we have maybe a blowout of one of those valves on the leg as an example, now we have too much pressure in one segment of a blood vessel. Now this overpressurization creates an aneurysm and a ballooning of this blood vessel, creating a varicose vein. And you'll see the elderly, they'll have these big bubbles in their legs, these varicose veins, where if they, they hit these bubbles and rupture them, it doesn't cause them a whole lot of pain. But man, do they bleed like stink. Holy cow. You'll walk into an apartment or a house, it's like a massacre in there. There's blood everywhere. And you'll see somebody with a t-shirt or a paper towel on their legs. Oh dear, I think I hurt myself. Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> so let's take a look at this picture here. This is the cardiovascular system in a nutshell. Uh, a lot of big blood vessels, aorta, superior, inferior vena cava, so on and so forth. <clears throat> Pardon me. The big two that I really want you to pay attention to, uh, the brachial artery and the femoral artery. Uh, those are the ones uh, during TCCC and tourniquet placement. Those are the ones we're really trying to affect by compressing them. Uh, and we'll get more into that in other, in other chapters. All right, so I'll pull this picture off. And next thing we're going to look at is the actual breakdown of blood vessels. So, as we said before, blood leaves left ventricle, goes out into the aorta, and makes its way around. And I kind of do this because it goes from the ascending aorta, transverse aorta, to the descending aorta, and makes its way all the way down into the body. And that aorta is a monster. And what ends up happening is if you took a section of the aorta and cut it out of the body, and filleted it open and butterflied it open like a, like a steak, which is pretty disgusting, I know. But when you butterfly it open, what you're going to see all, all the way through that aorta are little holes. And what these holes represent is where they have the branches of arteries popping off of that aorta. Every part of our body has to be perfused with oxygenated blood. So as we just saw in one of the last pictures, the first bifurcation off of your aorta as it leaves your left ventricle is actually 
your coronary arteries. The body is really pretty creative and she takes, Mother Nature takes that most oxygenated blood for herself and brings it right back to the heart. Well, then some of the next bifurcations are going to be going up to your brain. Yeah, so Mother Nature is pretty crafty in how she does this. But as we work our way down, we've got blood vessels for our lungs, uh, you know, our, our bronchial arteries, mesenteric arteries, splenic artery, renal arteries, uh, you name it. Every piece of our body needs to have an artery to supply with oxygenated blood. So we go from our aorta to an artery. From an artery, we branch down a little bit smaller. We go to an arteriole. To an, from an arteriole, and I'll put this picture up on the board, or up on the screen, you'll see we branch down to capillary beds. During perfusion, all right, quote unquote, um, this is where the magic happens, at the capillary beds. Uh, remember in the first video we talked about capillaries being one cell thick, those endothelial cells and those gaps in between those, uh, those cells. Here's where we have gas exchange, waste product, carbon dioxide, oxygen, electrolytes, fluids, everything passes through these gaps in the endothelium at the capillary level. So on the venous side of the house, or more specifically the arterial side of the house, moving, think of, think of it from left to right, from the arterial side of the house, we get to this tissue, any tissue USA, we're dumping oxygen. As we move our way along, at the same time, now because of diffusion, we're now picking up carbon dioxide. As we transition our way to the venous side of these capillary beds, well now we have deoxygenated blood. This deoxygenated blood goes into venules, from venules we go into veins, and from veins we dump into the inferior superior vena cava, back into the right atrium, and away we go. So one last thing I wanna show you on this picture before I pull it off the screen, is your tunica intima, your tunica media, and your tunica externa, or in some books you'll hear it referred to as your tunica adventitia. Um, that's right in the center of your screen there. This is more applicable in, in this piece of conversation to the artery than the vein. Because again, the artery is very, very muscular. If you ever wanted to identify an artery and a piece of meat that you were cutting up to eat, like a steak or whatever, uh, typically it's that blood vessel that's poking out at you and you can still see it you can still see the opening, the inner lumen of that. That's an artery. Uh, veins lay flat if they're not under pressure. Uh, arteries kind of stay open. So the tunica intima, tunica media, tunica adventitia, when we start talking about aneurysms um, and blood kind of false tracking and tearing in between the lining of a blood vessel or an artery or an aorta here in this scenario, um, we're talking about blood flow in between the tunica intima and the tunica media, between the inner lining uh, of this blood vessel and the middle lining. So when we talk about aneurysms, when we talk about dissecting transverse aneurysms, it's a false passage of blood in this space. So that's, uh, that's pretty much that. All right, I'll pull this uh, picture off and let's move our way on here. So cardiovascular system, we covered very quickly and we're gonna re- we're going to discuss it again when we get into cardiovascular emergencies in a later video, but that's just a broad stroke overview. Uh, lymphatic system, uh, something that isn't really covered very much is your lymphatic system. It's kind of the unforgotten or unsung hero. Um, it's a unique system. It's a, considered to be a circulatory, a PC or circulatory system, but it, it's a one-way system. It's designed to help fight infection, control fluid balance, um, so on and so on. So think of it this way, um, you sprain your ankle. Okay, you sprain your ankle, swells up, swells up big. Over time, right, a little bit of elevation, ice, all the things that you know we tell you to do, um, that swelling goes down. Well, one of the big things that actually reduces that swelling is your lymphatic system. Because now what ends up happening is that tissue as it starts to, to become engorged with fluid, well now your lymphatic system is being sort of pulled open, if you will. So try to imagine them as blood vessels. There's no blood in them, but try to imagine them as blood vessels. But as that tissue starts to swell, now there's little doors and little openings in the lymphatic system that now become enlarged, and fluid starts to dump into the lymphatic system, and it takes it away. The lymphatic system is a one-way system, whereas your cardiovascular system is a fully circular system and enclosed. So what ends up happening now is all this fluid that's being pulled off of the tissue over a certain period of time turns into lymph. I'm not even 100% sure how that happens, but now we have lymph fluid 
as we make our way into a lymph node. We have lymph nodes all over our body, but the vast majority of them you'll find in your, in your neck, uh, your armpit, your groin. Uh, those are the three big clusters, but we have lymph nodes all over the place. So in a sprained ankle, eventually we're going to have to, that fluid is going to make its way to our, our, our groin area. Filter through these lymph nodes, and what it's filtering is any kind of microorganisms. Anything the body doesn't want, it filters it out. And eventually, all lymph vessels will dump into your left and right uh, subclavians, essentially, and dump right back into general circulation again. So it's a one-way system, but it's designed to help with fluid loss and fluid control um, and uh, help with infection. So as an example, uh, if we have a woman who's had uh, a radical mastectomy, right side, let's say, right side, one of the things she's going to tell you is don't take a blood pressure in my right arm because what they're afraid of is if you create tissue damage here and the body is trying to reduce swelling and fight, all the lymph nodes here are gone. So if you damage that arm or if you start an IV in that arm and introduce a microorganism, it's a straight shot to the body. There's no lymph nodes here because they remove the lymph nodes when they uh, remove that breast. Now it's a straight shot into the system without that filter. So we always have to be aware of people who may have had lymph nodes removed for whatever reason, because that's the importance of the lymphatic system and, and the role it plays. So here's a quick picture of the lymphatic system. It shows tonsils, thymus, uh, spleen, bone marrow, lymph nodes, vessels, just a quick, quick uh, picture of it. Uh, it's something that we don't even think about pre-hospitally. Uh, we don't give it much in the way of attention. We don't cannulate it. We don't give any drugs to affect it, quite frankly. Uh, so again, it's sort of the unsung hero. So we'll pull that off and let's do a quick, quick overview of respiratory system and airway. We're going to go over this again when we start talking about airway in a different video, but upper airway, lower airway. So on your screen now is a picture of the upper airway. Pretty classic uh, picture that you see all the time, uh, your nasal cavity, your oral cavity, uh, tongue, epiglottis, trachea, esophagus, pretty straightforward. Uh, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngeopharynx, very fancy names. Think of pharynx as a fancy name for throat. It's really all it is. So when we talk about our nasopharynx, we're talking about where your throat meets up with your nasal cavity. And we're talking about our oropharynx. We're talking about where our oral cavity or our mouth meets up with the back of our throat. Then, of course, the laryngeopharynx, where our larynx or our vocal cords kind of come together with our throat. I want you to take a quick notice of the nasal cavity itself. And later on, we're going to talk about NPA placement and putting in an NPA, nasal pharyngeal airway. We talk about lying someone supine, having them on their back. As an example, they don't have to be on their back. But putting that patient in a position where you give them a little piggy nose, right? you pick their nose up a little bit and push that NPA straight into their face. Right. That's If you look at this, now that makes more sense. We don't want to go up into the turbinates. We don't want to go up into the top of the nose. That's just not the way the nose is designed. This is why we stick the NPA straight in. Um, as we work our way down, our epiglottis, uh, that flap that protects us from aspiration during eating or drinking and covers up the trachea when we swallow, that's the anatomical dividing line between our upper and lower airway. So in the pre-hospital environment, here is where we have the biggest bang for the buck. Here is where we can make the most difference by maintaining a patent airway, either with an OPA, an NPA, a supraglottic airway, an endotracheal tube. Um, upper airway problems are what's going to kill us the fastest. But now as we transition into our lower airway, and you see this picture up on the screen, very rudimentary drawing, uh, your trachea, left and right main stem, bronchi, uh, rolling down into your, uh, your bronchioles, making your way all the way down to your alveoli. Um, and your alveoli is where all of your gas exchange take place. So when you take that deep breath in and bring air all the way down to your alveoli, your alveoli are only one cell thick. Your capillaries that surround your alveoli are only one cell thick. So when those two come together and you have these alveolar capillaries uh, kind of surrounding your alveoli, here's where the diffusion takes place. Here's where the gas exchange takes place. <coughs> Excuse me. We have very little to do with lower airway 
problems uh, on the basic side of the house. On the advanced side of the house, we can give steroidals, we can give bronchodilators, albuterol, atrovent, solumedrol, prednisone, and so on and so on and so on. Um, so we can have some effect on smooth muscle of our lower airway, uh, but in the pre-hospital environment, unless we're assisting somebody with their albuterol or maybe giving them an EpiPen in the case of anaphylaxis, uh, this is the only time that we're ever going to be able to really affect uh, these structures. So if you look at that picture, and you, it's hard to see in this picture, it's not the most accurate, but as you work your way down, when we get into our smaller airways, we start to lose cartilaginous structure and we start to gain smooth muscle. So that's what we're trying to capitalize on with our pharmaceuticals, as we're trying to play around with the smooth muscle in the smaller airways to create bronchodilation, or very rarely do we ever try to create bronchoconstriction. Um, so as we work our way down into the alveoli, that's what we're looking to do. Uh, we'll get into asthma and bronchitis and COPD and afflictions like that in a later video. So let me pull this off the screen. Uh, let's see, let's move on now to, and the reason I want to move on is last video I went about an hour and three minutes, which as far as I'm concerned is probably about 15 minutes too long. So I really want to keep these to about 45 minutes. I don't want to go much longer than that. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Because again, like I said, we're going to hit all of these topics again in very general detail when we get into the actual topics themselves. So when we talk about uh, respiratory emergencies, we're going to you know, go over A and P one more time. So let's look at your GI tract. Uh, very little in the way of emergencies, pre-hospital uh, emergencies in this area. Yeah, somebody can have a bleeding ulcer and that could be bad. Uh, somebody can have diverticulitis, uh, a flare-up of Crohn's disease, a number of different things. But in the pre-hospital environment, there's very little we're going to be able to do about it. They need you know, more definitive care. Let's work our way down from, uh, from top down. Uh, mouth, obviously, it's where mastication, careful with the word, mastication takes place. And I'll put this picture up so you can see the different areas I'm talking about. So as we start to chew uh, in the process of mastication, we start to infuse food with saliva, amylase, a number of different digestive enzymes. We'll swallow down the esophagus, these paras, um, uh, these, uh, para listen to me, I can't even produce the, pronounce the word now. We have these uh, these waves, and for the life of me, I don't know why, it's jumping out of my head. It'll come back to me. We Thank you. My wife just threw that at me. Parastolis. It's good to have another medical provider in the house. Uh, we have these parastolic, or these parastolysis waveforms that'll bring that food down to our stomach through our cardiac sphincter. Our cardiac sphincter is where the, uh, the esophagus and the stomach kind of meet up. The stomach doesn't do a whole lot other than house that food start to continue or continue the breakdown of food, pepsin, hydrochloric acid, a number of different things are, are going on in the stomach. But all the stomach does is sort of break it down a little bit and they turn it into what's called chyme or chyme, however you want to pronounce it. And then it'll kick it out through the pyloric sphincter. And your pyloric sphincter is where the first part of your small intestine, your duodenum or your duodenum, um, come together. And as it squeezes into the first part of your duodenum, you have a little area called your, your sphincter of Oti, uh, which is a, a hole that is coming from your, your gallbladder, essentially. And what's happening now in this phase is the gallbladder is squeezing uh, bile, which is produced in the liver, through that sphincter of Oti. And there's also another uh, duct from your pancreas coming in that's producing or providing uh, uh, different enzymes that'll start to help break down fat. So through this sphincter of Odi, we're actually injecting these digestive fluids into the duodenum to help break down fat. During uh, cholecystitis or a gallbladder attack, uh, somebody who has gallstones, if that gallbladder is removed, now the patient has far less of uh, these factors that'll help break down fat, which is why people who don't have a gallbladder have a harder time in the breakdown of, of fatty foods. So your duodenum is your first part of your small intestine, uh, and then we start to slowly but surely transition in, into our jejunum and our ileum. 
within our small intestine, here is where all of our nutrients are being absorbed. We absorb no nutrients in the stomach whatsoever. Uh, all of our uh, drug absorption, food absorption, so on and so forth, takes place in the small intestine. And I want to say, don't quote me on this, there's somewhere about 22 to 24 feet of small intestine within our, within our body. Um, I had the, the pleasure, if you want to call it that, of years ago, somebody being filleted open with a box cutter, and he had his, his guts, so sausage, all right? He had his, his intestines laying next to him, and we had to scoop them kind of back onto his belly, not into his abdominal cavity, but back onto his belly and get him over to the, uh, to the trauma center. He was a mess. And the funny thing is, I asked the doctor uh, while we're in the trauma room, I said, hey, doc, I said, is that like a roadmap or something? You know, that when you put this back in, you have to put it in a certain way. And he looked at me and he said, no, because we put it back in there and it figures itself out. And I said, really? You know, eight years of, of internship and all those other kinds of nonsense to be a surgeon and you just stick it back in there? That's it? I said, oh, I thought there would have been more to it than that. But anyway, um, so from your ileum, uh, the last part of your small intestine into your uh, into your actual large intestine itself, your colon is an area called your ileocecal valve. Uh, and this is that transition between small intestine and large intestine. Right in that area is also your appendix. You can have an appendix anywhere in your intestinal tract, essentially, but this is where we more commonly find it. So within the large intestine, we have our ascending, our transverse, and our descending colon. Here is where we start to take that chyme or chyme, and we start to pull fluid out of it. And here's where the body absorbs the vast majority of its, of its water. It pulls it out of this area and now, uh, not to say hydrates us, but brings it back into our system. And here is now we start to form up a, a turd, for a lack of better terms, uh, is where fecal matter starts to be formed up. Makes its way to the sigmoid colon, rectum, and away it goes. Uh, there can be problems anywhere in between, and we'll get more into that in trauma when we start talking about eviscerations. Uh, when we get into medical emergencies, we'll talk more about different afflictions of this area, problems of the liver, uh, esophageal varices, a number of different things. Um, so let's move on, and I'll pull that screen down. Let's look at the kidneys real quick. and They are a fantastic structure, structures, uh, two of them. Uh, and they sit pretty high, uh, higher than most people think in the retroperitoneal space, right? You have your peritoneum where your guts are, and then you have your retroperitoneal space behind that area uh, where your kidneys lie. So if you're standing upright and you let your arms hang down naturally, more or less where your elbows are, that's where your kidneys are. So in boxing, when they talk about no kidney punches, they don't want you punching this person in the back just right around where your, your, the bottom of your rib cage is around your back, your floating ribs, uh, that's where your kidneys are. Little things, there's not much to them, only about yay big, um, but very, very vascular, and they're really not secured very well, right? If uh, I'm gonna put this picture up here, you'll see your renal artery and your renal vein, and there's a lot of fatty tissue and connective tissue that surround the kidney and hold it into place, but for the most part, if we have huge deceleration trauma, these kidneys can pull away from those renal arteries and renal veins. And in the grand scheme of things, those blood vessels are really pretty big uh, when we look at them. So if you pull that kidney away from those two main blood vessels, that person is going to bleed like stink into that retroperitoneal space. You'll never know it. You won't see a drop of blood. Um, so when we get into trauma, I'm going to tell you that blood hides in three places. Uh, blood hides in the belly, peritoneal, uh, blood hides in the back, retroperitoneal, and blood hides in the pelvis, as we discussed during the last video. So if you have somebody who suffered from blunt force trauma, penetrating trauma to the torso, abdomen, pelvis, and they are shocky, and you swear they're bleeding out somewhere, but you don't see any outside bleeding, think peritoneal, think retroperitoneal, Think pelvis. Those are the three areas your, your patient's bleeding out into, possibly. And this next picture here uh, shows the, the functional unit of the kidney, uh, the, the nephron. And this becomes an extremely complicated topic at the paramedic level when we talk about um, excretion, uh, urine production, blood pressure management, 
a lot of it takes place right here. And in, in later chapters, we may talk about the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system as part of a homeostatic type of a system. And the kidneys play a huge role in that. Kidneys play a tremendous role in blood pressure uh, uh, management, quite frankly. So if you look at this, and you look at Bowman's capsule and the glomulus, that area there, it's kind of at your, your 11 o'clock on your screen. Um, that's really the meat and potatoes of it all. That's where most of your filtration takes place. Blood pressure management takes place, and it's extremely delicate. As we work our way through the nephron and we get down to the bottom there, uh, you'll see your proximal tubule, and you'll see your loop of Henel or loop of Henley, however you want to pronounce it. In the paramedic world, we give a drug called Lasix or furosemide that by definition is called a loop diuretic. Well, the reason it's called a loop diuretic is because this is the area of the nephron that it works on. It works on the loop of Henel. And the bad part about Lasix is that it is not potassium sparing. Uh, what ends up happening through the distal tubules and proximal tubules and all of the network of, of surface area there is electrolytes are excreted and pulled back in based on what the body needs. And fluids are excreted and pulled back in depending on what the body needs. So some diuretics will be potassium sparing, where they won't pull as much potassium out, where others are a bit more unforgiving and they'll pull more potassium out, which is why uh, more times than not, if you find a patient who is on furosemide or Lasix, they're also taking a potassium supplement, uh, slow K, micro K, or the doctor tells them to eat a banana every day. It's because these drugs pull a lot of potassium from this loop of Henel or Henley. So just as an FYI. So I'll pull that screen down, and that is the vast majority of what I wanted to talk about with anatomy and physiology. Uh, I think I've covered everything. Check my notes here. Yep. It's a broad stroke overview. It's a lifetime of study in two hours. Uh, so trust me, we didn't get too far into the weeds, but it's just a good starting point uh, to get us kicked off to future topics where we're going to just continue to talk about anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology. It's so important. It really is uh, in, in understanding the disease process and traumatic injuries and so on and so forth. Um, I hope you liked the changes I made. I'm going to continue to try and make this better as we as we go along. Um, I'm having fun with it. Uh, continue to have fun with it. I hope you continue to watch. I hope you continue to enjoy it. I hope you stay well and corona-free. The password for, uh, for this video is books. All right, my little, my little books, any old book. Uh, some of you are getting again creative with your uh, putting the code word into a sentence. I want to see how you how you work this one in. So again, have a great day. Be safe, and we'll see you on the next video. Take care. Mm -hmm.